first of all, I want to thank not only the organizers for asking me to come here, but the talks have been really interesting. And as um, a not active scientist anymore, it's really a pleasure for me to sit and listen to what's going on in fields that are very close to my own heart. Uh, since everyone is doing biographies, my own work actually was in speech communication, which is an area where there's very intricate motor control. Someone once estimated there are about 36 muscles needed to be activated in the right timing and the right amount and over a certain time frame in order to produce the syllable ba. So we're talking about a very complicated motor system that wouldn't exist if there weren't also a social structure where people were perceiving the outward results of these motor actions, either acoustically or visually, and that also contacted the cognitive system because it meant something. So this notion of there being kind of artificial distinctions between production, perception, and cognition is something that I got from the, my first day in graduate school, so it, I feel right at home. Um, I'm going to talk today not about what Tim said I was going to talk about. I'm not going to talk so much about <laughs> future directions in the field, but instead I'm going to kind of exhort people a bit to change how we do science now a little bit. So Tim set it up when he talked about there being a continuum between basic research and applied research. And quite a while ago, in 1997, um, Stokes wrote a very interesting book, really, about an idea that was not a continuum from basic to applied research, but rather he set up a two-by-two two continuum where you have on this y-axis fundamental understanding, the kind of stuff that you and I do all the time, and then a consideration for use on the x-axis. How useful is it in society? So most of us have grown up in a tradition where the top left quadrant, basic research, curiosity-driven research, is really where we spend most of our time. And Stokes identified that kind of stuff with Niels Bohr. Right? Most of us know if he had something to do in science. And he's the one over on the right. I just put that particular picture, put a little diversity in there. And the bottom right, the applied research, right? Not, it's still curiosity-driven, but for a particular aim. Was exemplified by Thomas Edison, who would hold gazillion patents. But his innovation, Stokes's innovation, was really this top right quadrant, which he called use inspired basic research. And he identified it mostly with the work of Louis Pasteur, because Pasteur always worked in an applied setting. But he did so in a way that fundamentally changed our understanding of the basic mechanisms underlying disease. Okay, so huge ramifications for basic understanding of science, even though it was done mostly with an applied purpose. Okay. Um, most of you might be familiar with this, but I'm going to just use it a, a, a little bit because I think that we've been skirting some of these ideas over the last couple of days. Now, in my role recently as a science administrator, essentially, I not only get to see a broad view of the science, which is wonderful. But I also get to see a broad view of science culture, which is sometimes not so wonderful. And we've seen a lot of pictures in the talks over the last few days that have looked kind of like this. You know, the history of science seems to be white men. And we are sort of revising history that way. So I thought I would use this instead of talking about Pasteur's Quadrants. I'm talking about the top right quadrant, which I will admit I had as the top left for a while there. Um, I just show you three others who exemplify these particular aspects of science. Has anyone ever heard of Dorothy Hodgkin? Yay! <laughs> uh, you've probably heard of Rosalind Franklin, um, James Watson, and Francis Crick. And as you know, they used X-ray crystallography in order to identify the structure of DNA. They could not have done that without the work that Dorothy Hodgkin did, and she in fact got a Nobel Prize for this, and I think it was 63. And what she did was really perfect. And, uh, well, she discovered protein crystallography, which allowed her to use it to show the structure of proteins for the first time. She showed the structure of penicillin, 
insulin and vitamin B12. And she then went on to help perfect the technique of x-ray crystallography, without which the so-called discoverers of the DNA structure couldn't have done their work. For, let's go to the bottom right now for applied research. Catherine Burr Blodgett worked for General Electric during World War II. And she was involved in an incredible number of inventions that improved gas masks. She invented a de-icing technique for airplanes. And she's most known for, in her chemistry work, she created non-reflective glass. You know, the eyeglasses you can now see through, which I still find kind of weird. But I love it when you go to a museum and you don't have all the light reflections. She's the one who invented that. The top right for use inspired basic research, Mary or Marie Daly. Um, Marie Daly was really interested in how what we ate affected our health. Right? So what she did was eventually, eventually led to the discovery of a link between high cholesterol and diet in health and life expectancy. So we've seen pictures of puppies, we've seen pictures of kittens, we've seen pictures of lots of old white guys. I'm not going to show pictures of tamarins, I'm not showing pictures of my kids, but I am showing pictures that I think help revise, at least for this half an hour, the history of science. We don't want to rewrite the history of science. Now, of course, the distinctions between basic research, applied research, and use inspired research, these are very fuzzy distinctions. They are all continual. It's sometimes hard to say, well, you're on one side or something else. But sometimes because these are blurry distinctions, we miss opportunities. As scientists, we are now in a particular um, a climate where the use of science is really important to convey to the general public, right? And to those people who control the purse strings. And we're, as a field, we're really not very good at that. And sometimes we're not good at it because of the nature of the work, because it's hard for people to understand. Sometimes because we make the experiments so rarefied and so controlled that they sound really trivial unless you already understand why they're important. So sometimes it's just a matter of framing. But sometimes it's really going out, looking at a use where your research really can have an impact and not after you do your experiments trying to apply it to that, but rather before you do the experiments, going and find the people who work in those areas, talk to them, find out what they have already known is important, don't reinvent the wheel. And then the experiments get done in that context. It really is very broadening. There are pitfalls, of course, because most of the time then you're doing multidisciplinary science. And we still have vocabulary problems. So I heard the word embodiment several times over the last couple of days. I know from unfortunate personal experience that the way we use the term embodiment and the way people in computer science use it and the way engineers use the term, we're talking three different definitions. Sometimes the ambiguity works in our favor, but sometimes it really doesn't. And we have to recognize other people's definitions in order to understand their concerns. And hopefully you find people in those areas that will do the same for our science. Um, but that's really the way to transfer things more into this use-inspired research, but still basic research. This isn't so much of a change in direction as a change in emphasis. So if you look at both the NSF and NIH mission statements, these are on their website. NSF is to promote the progress of science. Yay, that's our basic research, right? But it's also to advance the national health, prosperity, and welfare, and to secure the national defense. Time for other purposes. Okay. And the part I bolded is now front and center when it comes to how governments are partialing money for their funding agencies. And this isn't just in the US. In the European Union and in the UK, there's also the same kind of push, not towards applied research so much, but use inspired, seeing the connection between the basic research and something that's going to be good for people. Right? The NIH has as its mission statement to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature, behavior, and living systems, and the application 
of that knowledge to enhance health, lengthen life, and reduce illness and disability. Several times in the talks, we've heard people say, oh, we chose these parameters because the clinicians told me they know this is important. That kind of back and forth interaction is really important. Doesn't mean that fundamental curiosity-driven research is useless. Of course it isn't. But there is a need in society, and these are the people here who actually can contribute to that need. Interestingly, the places that really um, recognize the importance of the behavioral, cognitive, and motor sciences, it's often coming from industry. And one area, this is just one area, where I think that our sciences have a lot to say is in what I would call human-centered technology. Some subset of human-computer interaction, human-centered computing, and so on. But human-centered technology is putting the emphasis on the human using the technology. What we really need is the development of systems that allow trust among humans and machines, right? We need to understand how these so-called soft sciences are embodied in the dynamics of action of, between humans and between humans and machines in order to instantiate them in systems that people are actually going to use and trust. So half the time you listen to conversations going on and body language, the words aren't there. There's a lot of understood information. How do you understand other people's intentions? A lot of it is in our gestures and in our body movements. We've seen that here. But how do you take those dynamics and understand them in a way that you can instill them in these kinds of interactive systems? This is a place that's going to be huge in the next 10 years. And this area has a lot to say about it. Also, natural interfaces. I mean, I love the, I forgot what it is, I think it was Antonia, the cartoons of what people are really thinking. Well, Listen to my 95-year-old mother trying to talk to her Alexa. <laughs> Even without the Polish accent. She's saying, well, you know, you think you can read me? No, not that one. I mean, I think it's the one with you know, the blue cover. What book is this? This is the kind of, of natural interaction that we need, the way people really work, not one word at a time speaking and reading. We also need somehow to build into these systems an awareness of things like mood, surrounding situation, flexibility, and learning. Because we're always adapting to each other, as we saw in the two-person situation. We're adapting to each other both on the short term, but also learning on the long term. And this has to be built into human-centered technology, not just one-on-one, -on -one, person to machine, but also groups of people interacting with an engineered system, and also a person interacting with more than one engineered system at a time. We don't always have to think of robots. I mean, the things we all have in our pockets and our, these are all engineered systems that are really important. I remember years ago, I had a, a PhD student who was sent to me from IBM, who was great. They paid for him to go to graduate school. And he was working for them on Oscar. Anyone remember Oscar? It was like the original um, personal digital assistant. Why did it not sell? It, I mean, it had a very good operating system. It was built by IBM. And one reason it didn't sell is that there were only like five of them that they built. And they were so protective of them that when they went to a conference, the person demonstrating it could say, yes, you can use it. But the IBM person had to hold it while the other person pressed the button, the user pressed the buttons. And of course, then there's no anticipatory reactions, no uh, pre or post procrastination. And people thought, this is totally clunky, it doesn't work. Right? And then they just missed the book. So we need systems that we're going to use and that are adaptive and flexible. And again, this group, we're looking at the dynamics of action, the dynamics of cognition, and how those dynamics can be embodied in these systems will have an awful lot to say if you bother. Right? If you bother to go to use inspired research. Now there are an awful lot of application areas for this kind of work, not just human-centered technology. You can read through those. I don't have to, to read through them. Um, but the question is not, how do we make this engineered system better? That's applied research. The question is, what basic science understanding does the 
each situation required. That's the kind of push where we can go to use inspired basic research where we're still learning a lot about basic information about humans work, play, act, listen, and so on. So these are just some of the fundamental research questions. Uh, I just happened to come up with them. You can come up with others of your own. But, uh, you can read through them, but you can see that they're basic questions, but they can be put in a context. Um, and one of the more interesting things for me is that the place where most of the research on this is going on is in industry. It's a harbinger of what's going to be in all our, of our homes, cars, factories, <coughs> places of work, and so on in the next 10 years, or maybe even less. When I go to industry conferences, I am amazed at how far and away, how far they've gotten. And they're putting a lot of money and a lot of effort into understanding human behavior in these contexts. And um, in order to do that, we don't want them to ignore the work going on in 